is this? Can you say hi? Say hi. It's me, Cloud Baby. <gasps> say hi. Show everybody your teeth. Say Happy New Year. <laughs> you good girl. Can you wave? Okay, too much clout, too much clout. You gotta go. <laughs> mm. Oh, hi. Happy New Year's. I, I heard everyone was like me and not going out tonight. So I was like, well, let's all hang out together. I'm not feeling the greatest today. My little ones passed on the colds that they got. I mean, it was expected. We just got back from the Dominican and went from like <laughs> plus 30 to minus 30 in like 12 hours. So I apologize that I'm like, you know, not the cutest for New Year's today, but I wanted to hang out regardless. Right now we are at the most adorable little Airbnb. I'm gonna do like a little tour of it on my Instagram story. So if you're not following me on Instagram and you want a know, and you want a know, and you want to know, um, a little bit about the situation we're in right now, then come on over there. I do have so much to talk about and fill you guys in with. Today is not the time though, but I will fill you in very soon. Until then, let's talk about today's sponsor and then talk about some true crime. Before we get started, I have to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Casetify. I'm not gonna lie, I've been dying for this sponsorship. Casetify is a brand that I've been using for years, not only myself, but my entire family. So, I mean, I was like, I was already just like so excited to talk about Casetify. And then they just go over above and beyond and they send this. I can't. So I've waited to open it up with you guys. There was so much cute stuff that I, I'm not gonna lie, I can't even remember what I chose. So this is gonna be like an exciting like Christmas moment that we're gonna experience together. I, I, I don't even wanna unwrap it, it's so cute. Dun, 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 dun. Oh yes! Little note, thanks a million for choosing us. Like no, thank, thank you for being you. You guys look how cute this little display is. So these were the cases I picked. We'll go through them. I thought these little guys were so adorable. These little smiley guys. They're almost like little glow in the dark, like ghosty smileys. I don't know, they're freaking adorable. And then I picked this one. It looks like like acrylic paint and it looks like it's raised. I honestly like was expecting it to be like bumpy, but it's just smooth, but Look at the detail. And I'm pretty sure all of these I got with the um, the Ultra Impact cases because I'm almost like embarrassed to talk about how many times I have dropped my cell phone in the past. You know that feeling when it like slips out of your hands and your heart just sinks, it just like smacks the pavement. You're like, yep, she's smashed to smithereens right now. You don't even wanna like turn it around and look at it and then sure enough, like it is. So I didn't even realize that since we've had like case to five cases on our phones, I've never had that feeling anymore. I mean, I think I did probably like the first like like one or two or 10 times <laughs> that I dropped it. And then now it's just like second nature. Like I'm like, oh yeah, it's fine. Like just let, let's just launch it for fun. Like look at my case, this is what it does. Oh, this is the only one that I didn't get like the little bumpers on, you know, like when you're bowling, you got those like bumper guards. But this one was clear and I wanted to put like a little Polaroid photo behind it of my my family. And then this one I just adore. Like look at those little cow print cowboy hats. I'm on like a Yellowstone kick right now. So I think I think I'm Beth Dutton or something like that. And this is my little rip, my little rip phone case. <laughs> This haul, I didn't actually personalize anything, which is surprising because I usually do. I was probably just like too caught up and excited in the moment. <laughs> That's one thing I love about Caseify though, is that you can personalize your phone case to pretty much like look any way you want it to. And you don't like have to like sacrifice like cuteness for like durability. So even a cute little phone case like this is still protected with their drop test approved Qi Tech technology. Essentially what that means is you could drop this bad boy from like nine feet high and it would be okay. On top of durability, I adore that Caseify cases, they are 100% non-toxic and non-hazardous, which seems like such a silly thing to mention because it's like, it's a phone case, Sherilyn. We're not talking like biohazard waste. But when you sit back and you think about like all of the things that we interact with during the day that aren't the greatest for us, it's pretty alarming. So having a case on one of the things that I am constantly using day in and out, you know, free of all those icky things, like it's just comforting. Not only that, but their impact and ultra impact cases are also made up of 65% recycled and plant-based material. And they're also compatible with 5G and wireless 
wireless charging. Also, this might be my favorite part, just like in this time that we're in right now, especially because Reverie always grabs my phone and like wants to like chew on it. And the cases are germ free because they kill 99% of germs that come in contact with it. Like what? Like a phone case that truly does and has it all. I mean, so many wins all around. You definitely need one. And if you're still in the giving spirit or you like to give like all year round, everybody you know also needs one. <laughs> They make awesome gifts. Right now, Caseify is offering my true crime fam 15% off your order. All you have to do is go to caseify.com slash Sherilyn to receive that discount. I may or may not be going on the site to use my own discount code to go and personalize even more cases for myself. It's just so fun to do. One of my favorite cases is actually not even mine, it's Brent's. And we made this like well over a year ago and it's still in like mint condition. I, I seriously just, I can't say enough. So thank you again, Case for sponsoring today's video and also for protecting pretty much our like our lifeline in the most durable and precious personalized way. I'm seriously so thankful and I can't wait to see what my true crime fam comes up with. You guys, Caseify, I'm just so excited about it. Okay, okay, let's get into the video. Grab your New Year's snacks and drinks today. I am just drinking a little coffee with, with some French vanilla. I'm feeling those cozy vibes today. All right, today we are talking about... <laughs> I, I don't know how to say it. Like one of the most dramatic serial killers um, I think we've ever talked about on the channel. I didn't even know where I was half the time like researching. I'm like, is this a true crime story or is this like some true crime soap opera? It's like filled with prison escapes, escapes en route to the prison, jewel heists, murder, and even living with the wife of a victim and convincing her that he had just like up and left and abandoned the family and then this guy like takes his place. Yeah, it's got it all. Oh, my little widow's peak is like extremely prominent right now. <laughs> Today we're talking about Gary Evans. He was born on October 7th, 1954 in Troy, New York. I didn't even know there was a place called Troy, New York. And now it's definitely gonna be a place that I have to go to because a person very near and dear to my heart was named Troy. Unfortunately, we lost him. He was murdered in 2007. And anytime I hear the name Troy, it just like warms my heart because it makes me think of him. So I choose to think of him when I think of like Troy, New York and not like this guy being from there. He was born to Roy and Flora Evans. Flora had been married prior to meeting Roy and had a little girl named Robbie in that relationship. Outside looking in, the family appeared to be like your typical all-American family. They went to church all the time. The kids would even get like recognition pins um, at Sunday school for never missing a Sunday school class. Gary was a straight A student. He was even photographed in the newspaper shaking hands when he was a little boy with uh, Robert Kennedy when he came to visit Troy. But within the walls of the house, there was a lot of pain. Flora was a heavy drinker. She had a lot of issues with mental health that were not being treated. And so she would treat it with alcohol. She tried to take her life on multiple occasions. And unfortunately, this was something that the kids saw a couple times. So some traumatizing things that they were witnessed to. When the kids were little, Roy was in a serious accident and because of it, he couldn't work anymore. So all of the pressure was on Flora's shoulders to keep the house afloat. And that just kind of like added to her drinking and like just feeling overwhelmed. People who knew the family, like within the neighborhood, what they remembered most is that the kids were never allowed out. They couldn't come out and play with the other kids in the neighborhood. And even when they were inside their house, they they were usually confined like to their bedrooms. They weren't allowed to like even really like play and socialize with each other within the home. Their parents were also allegedly very abusive. They would tie them to the kitchen chairs and like force feed them to eat things that they hated like liver and onions. Allegedly, Gary was also sexually assaulted by his father when he was only eight years old. It was when he was only eight years old that he also started stealing. And he didn't go for something like a pack of gum or a chocolate bar from like your corner store. He went for a really nice necklace from a jewelry store that was valued at over like a thousand dollars and he gave it to his mom for a gift. You'd think if your eight-year-old came home with like a thousand dollar necklace you'd be like okay um adorable that you think of me. Where'd you get this though? Like we need to return it. This isn't okay. But I guess Flora was also like a little bit of a thief herself so she was impressed and kept it. 
from that moment forward, he just couldn't shake that lifestyle or like stealing at any chance that he could get. He would steal anything from like food at the grocery store to propelling down like ropes into jewelry stores when they were closed and like stealing from them like some mullet wielding James Bond. I don't know if he had a mullet, but it just like fits in my mind. <laughs> He's said to have almost this like Robin Hood persona to him because he would steal from people like drug dealers so people thought they kind of like deserved it. And a lot of things that he stole he gave to other people. Like he wouldn't keep it for himself. Like he liked to give gifts to people. I'm just like spitting everywhere. You know, oftentimes in these cases we hear if people are like stealing a lot, especially at a young age, they're trying to sustain a habit. Like usually it could be like drugs or alcohol, but Gary wasn't into any of that stuff. He was actually like a huge like workout machine. He didn't smoke, didn't do drugs, didn't drink, and he didn't really like to associate with people he did, who did. Like he thought they were like beneath him. And the motive behind him originally starting to like work out and get it like addicted to that lifestyle was that he wanted to be bigger and stronger than his dad so that he could no longer abuse him, which he accomplished. Once he attained that goal though and knew that his dad couldn't hurt him anymore, he still had like all this anger and rage within him and he would take it out on animals, specifically cats that were in the neighborhood. I mean, we've seen this so many times. Harming animals at a very young age is usually a pretty big red flag that you're gonna graduate to like humans at one point. Gary started spending time in jail at a very early age. I mean, like he started stealing at eight, so it's to be expected. But this allowed him to build relationships with the police. So he'd use that to his advantage and form connections with certain detectives. You know, like I guess a bond of sorts to share information with them, kind of like an informant, get himself out of you know sticky situations or get his sentence reduced and that's really kind of like how what his upbringing was all about it was quite repetitive actually like he would rob someone rob an antique store or a jewelry store he'd get caught he kind of like give some information get released do it all over again like it was it was a very routine thing for him to like be in and out of jail so in the mid 70s when he was released from jail he reconnected with some childhood friends that uh, he had met in his neighborhood their names were Tim Reisdorf and Michael Falco and the three of them all got an apartment together. Michael was born on February 3rd 1950 and he was looked at as quite the troublemaker like out of from a very young age. He was always the kid that was there when shit hit the fan like when kids came home and their parents were like what did you do? They'd be like oh it, Michael and I did it. He was the kid that everyone was with when they got in trouble. Tim was explained as being a very good kid, very sensitive, but he had this attraction to like hanging out with more of like the bad eggs and then he would just kind of get dragged into troublesome situations. So while living together, Gary and Michael kind of like joined forces and would rob places together. Gary didn't particularly like having a partner, but he saw like the value in, you know, like having like an extra set of hands, grab more things in a less amount of time and then like split the profit. Tim didn't particularly participate. Sometimes he was like along for the ride, but he really loved music and he had dreams of being in a band that would take off and make him famous one day. While they're all living together, like his earlier patterns before, where he would like steal and get caught and go to prison. This happened again in his adult life. One time when he got caught and sent to prison, he actually managed to escape. The story goes that he at the time was like kind of friends with some hell's angels that were in the jail and they like hoisted him up over some fence. So he was able to run away, but it only lasted for like five hours. He got caught, got brought back to jail. He was actually found on the ledge of a library and he was threatening to jump, but then they had somebody come in, like a negotiator, and convinced him to, you know, come down, go back to jail. So he was sentenced to another few years. And while he's in jail this time, he's just like sitting there stewing and he's really angry at Michael. He believed that Michael secretly ratted on him for deals in his cases. So he starts spiraling and just like building this like really dark rage 
page all focused on Michael. When he's released, he the last place that he knew was like his home with Michael and Tim. So he goes back there, even though he's got like reservations about him, even though he's been building up this hatred towards Michael, when he's released after a couple years, he moves back in with him and Tim and he goes straight back to stealing and just like picks up exactly where the two of them left off. I think there was maybe like a level of comfort that he felt with Michael and Tim. It was like they knew him when he was a young kid. They knew what he had gone through growing up with his parents and who by this time had actually both died. His mom died when she slipped on some ice trying to get in her car and she like hit her head and it knocked her unconscious but it was winter out so she froze to death. And then his dad died because he was really sick and Gary always regretted not being the one to kill his dad. So like he had almost like unfinished business just like in his heart. Like he he wanted actually to dig him up and then re-kill him and then bury him again so he could feel like he did it. He's a very complex guy, this guy. And you know what, to be honest, he was very smart. Throughout his whole entire life, he always wanted to like expand his intelligence. He read at any chance he could get you know like when he wasn't robbing places so it's unfortunate that he didn't use his smarts to you know better himself maybe you know dabble in like a business venture or something like he probably could have been really successful at that because he was considered like successful as like a criminal but instead of turning his life around you know like any of the times that he got arrested you know sitting in jail being like okay maybe I shouldn't do this anymore the determination to just be like meaner and buffer and a better thief like would just intensify each time now during the latest release when he moved back in with Tim and Michael he meets a guy named Damien Kumo and he's a fellow thief within the area and Gary goes to him for advice to see you know like what his thoughts were on like hitting certain spots if he thought it would be profitable or like a waste of time or high risk of getting caught. One place Damien suggests is this flea market that's not too far from the area that they live and it's got everything they like like jewelry antiques jewelry was specifically what they liked the most because they said it was easy to pawn and very hard to trace so he and michael think this flea market's going to be like a really good place to hit they go there one night they rob the place of like over fifteen thousand dollars worth of valuables but as they're leaving this cop that's patrolling the area sees their car coming from like the back of this building so pulls them over and the guys are like oh like sorry we were we were just going to the bathroom And he's like, okay, well, like, don't do it here. You're on private property. So he lets them go, but he takes their IDs. So the next morning when everybody arrives at the flea market and see that it's been robbed, this cop finds out and he's like, okay, well... (laughs) shit. I have the guys, but he's got their names and addresses. So they got their first lead. While they're piecing all of this together though, back at the apartment, Gary's super paranoid. And on top of it, Tim, who he considered like his best friend, tips him off and says, you know, like, just be careful with Mike. I think he might be ripping you off. He also brought up the point that Mike didn't really have any loyalty to Gary. So he would probably flip on him at the drop of a hat just to get himself out of trouble. And after this last time that Gary was in jail he was like I am not going back there again like I've been there way too many times he had this feeling like if he went back again it was going to be like okay like clearly you're not learning you're staying in here for like 25 years so Mike's downstairs loading some of these things that they stole into Tim's car to like go and bury it somewhere and Gary goes down to help Mike load up the car but he comes down with a gun that just happens to have this like homemade silencer that he put on it so he's prepared for any situation and as soon as he sees Michael he just cannot contain himself he just like explodes he confronts him and says he knows that he's been stealing from him and Michael's like absolutely not like everything we've ever done we've split it we've split it 50 50 like when would I have the opportunity to steal from you like you would know I guess there's this necklace that went missing and Michael said he never touched it he thought that maybe it could have dropped out of like one of their pockets while they were leaving but he was adamant that he never took this but Gary was certain that he did so things are just escalating further they're just like going back and forth at each other being like no I didn't yes you did and while Michael's bent over loading up the trunk of the car Gary just shoots him in the back of the head right then and there and then just like ushers his body into the trunk He goes upstairs, goes to get Tim. He's like, we have got to haul ass right now. Tim has no idea what's going on. So he gets downstairs. Gary pops the trunk and he's like, what the shit? And Gary tells him, if you don't help me, you're next. 
So they drive the body out to Florida, not far from where Gary's sister lives, and bury it. And he flies under the radar and the police never get a chance to go to the apartment and catch him. So he's laying low, staying under the radar, and then April 20th, 1985, he decides, you know, it's time to get back to his ways. But he doesn't want to rob like a jewelry store anymore or like an antique shop. He decides that he wants to start targeting drug dealers because he thinks that it's going to be less likely that they'll, you know, call the police and report anything stolen. So he convinces one drug dealer to meet him and he says that he ripped off a different drug dealer and stole like a bunch of grass from him and he said that he'll sell it to him for like $15,000. I guess the amount that he had on him was like a lot more than that so it would have been like a really hefty profit for this guy so he agrees to meet Gary. When they meet up he counts the money in front of Gary, hands it to him and then Gary just like books it on foot. This was something he actually did quite often. He knew the area so well and I guess he's like known as being very stealthy. He was like this like buff spider-man that would just like get in and out of really tight situations and like parkour everywhere. So he's like weaving through fences, alleyways. He was dodging bullets as these drug dealers were like chasing him and shooting. Not only did he get away, but he had also circled back where this all happened and then stole one of their cars. I'm sure he was probably thinking like that was pretty epic getaway, but he underestimated these drug dealers because they did go to the police. They didn't say like, we were supposed to buy a bunch of marijuana off the guy, but they said that this guy stole their car and they happened to have quite a bit of money in it. So only like within hours, he's pulled over, he's arrested, tossed back in jail. This time when he's in jail, he meets uh, the son of Sam serial killer, David Berkowitz. I guess initially Gary didn't want anything to do with him. He actually didn't like the fact that David targeted like young women. He thought like, you know, like he could take out like other riffraff, but Gary was very, very full of himself. He considered himself like a workout superstar. So when David approached him and asked him for like tips and wanted to know if he would, you know, help him get into shape, Gary was like, yeah, sure. Like any chance that I can talk about myself and be complimented on my workout skills, like I'll take it. From there, I guess they built a really close relationship. They would even, you know, like send letters through other inmates if they were like separated or on different units. They spoke to each other in like medieval times I called each other like Sir David Lancelot. David even called Gary the Great Tricep King. Ew. So yeah, they had this friendship and when he's released, like he was kind of proud of it. When he leaves this last time, it's 1988 and he reconnects with Damien. He's the one that he went to for, you know, like advice on the streets and like what places to hit. I guess Damien was, you know, doing pretty well for himself out there in like that criminal world. So Gary thought it would be really beneficial for him to work closer with him. He considered Damien to be like, I guess like on his level of skills. Damien skill though was not jewelry stores. It uh, was like actual homes. Allegedly he had been breaking into homes since he was a teenager and it was just like something that he like felt more comfortable doing. I guess growing up his parents were very strict. His dad was said to go to church like every single day of his life and his form of punishment if like Damien did anything wrong was to lock him in the back shed in the backyard. So I think stealing at a really young age was probably his form of like rebellion but he never got caught. They I guess the family had this well in the front yard that didn't actually have any water in it so when he stole things like bikes or stuff like that he would put it in the well so no one would see it and then like retrieve it later. So I guess, you know, like if a partnership could make sense in this world, this one did. And so Damien and Gary built a really tight friendship as well. But according to Damien's girlfriend, Lisa, Gary took a lot of Damien's time up. So she absolutely hated this. She'd always tell Damien, you'd like lose this guy, you don't need him. But the two of them became known as like the dream team in this like underground world. So he was like pretty proud of this, you know, relationship and what they had accomplished together. It sounds like they kind of like meshed both of their preferences. I think they would like hit like flea markets or like antique shops and then they would also do like residential stuff. So like, you know, where each of them felt they were like 
stronger. So on September 8th, 1988, it was, you know, Gary's turn to shine. They were tipped off that this pawn shop wasn't too far from where they lived. And it was run by an older gentleman named uh, Douglas Berry. And Douglas didn't have like any security system or anything like that. No cameras on the property. And he worked it by himself. So the guys think this is going to be like a really easy job. They go to case it out and they learned, you know, like some of his patterns. And it seemed like every evening he left usually around 7 p.m. But the night they decided to rob the place, Douglas had decided to spend the night and do some inventory work. So the guys are like, like, why the F isn't he leaving yet? And instead of being like, okay, well, we'll just try this again tomorrow. They're like, no, we, we put all this time in. We want to get this done. We're going to follow through with it. So they wait until he falls asleep. It's about like 4.30 in the morning. They're like, okay, we're good to go. They break in and they're, you know, like creeping around really quietly, robbing the place. And Gary makes his way up to like this little like loft attic place and he sees this is where Douglas is sleeping. He has a gun with him and he decides he's just gonna sit there, stay on watch, and he's just like kind of got it pointed, ready to go if Douglas wakes up. Damien's downstairs. He's trying to be as quiet as possible, but I guess this building was a little bit older so it had like really creaky floors and like each step he made, it would creak a little bit more. And Gary can see like with each noise, like Douglas is stirring a little bit, like moving, and he's just like, oh my god, he's gonna wake up, which he does. He turns opens his eyes, sees Gary, and Gary shoots him. Damien hears the sound, so he like flies up to see what's going on, but it's not obvious that Douglas was dead, so Gary was like, you know, like, go back down, finish. So he finishes up, and a couple minutes later, they make off with about $30,000 worth of stolen goods. In the morning, Douglas's wife comes to the shop. She usually worked it with him, and she finds him. So she calls the police, and they come. They manage to pull a footprint off of the ground, and they also retrieve a pack of smokes that Damien had dropped when he was running away. When news breaks out about the robbery, Damien's gutted because he he finds out that Douglas died. He didn't consider himself a good guy. He was very aware that, you know, like the lifestyle he was living wasn't the greatest, but he never ever wanted anybody to get hurt. In fact, one time when he was robbing a home, a little girl woke up and he was like, oh, like, can you just go back to bed? And she was like, I'm really thirsty. I need some water. So he gets her water and like tucks her back in and then like goes back and, and robs the house. So when he finds out what happened to Douglas, he's really upset, but he's now scared of Gary because he's like okay well this guy just killed him so he kind of keeps close to him because he doesn't want to upset him or make him feel like he would rat him out and harm him or like Lisa or his daughter and while Damien's keeping that connection close not wanting to upset him Gary is also keeping Damien on a like very short leash you know he is there pretty much every single day all day making sure he's got his eyes on Damien and he's not gonna like do anything funny, which upsets Lisa because she already hates Gary and now she's like this guy, like we cannot get rid of him. But what ends up happening is they kind of like form this bond because she's left to rely a little bit on Gary when Damien's working late and she needs to work. Gary stays behind and will babysit their daughter. A lot of people who knew Gary said that there was this thing about him that you just trusted him even though you knew you shouldn't like your instinct was always being like this guy is just shady shouldn't trust him but he had this ability to just like drag you in and I mean I think that just like speaks for itself like with Damien being comfortable with him being around his family especially his daughter even though he knew what he was capable of. It's a part of his gut that unfortunately he didn't listen to and on December 26, Gary took advantage of Damien's trust. For weeks he had been in his head very paranoid about what had happened at the pawn shop and he was convinced that Damien was going to rat him out and then he also started thinking that he also was ripping him off like Michael. So he calls Damien and says, we've got to talk urgently. I don't want to do it over the phone. I'm coming to pick you up. He comes by the the house and I guess Lisa was sleeping because she had worked a night shift so Damien tells his daughter I'll be back in 30 minutes if mommy wakes up you know like just tell her I've stepped out but I'll be home soon he leaves with Gary and they drive to this secluded area and what he didn't know was Gary was planning this you know little drive for quite some time and about a week or so prior he had already pre-dug a grave that was waiting for them when they pull up to the location Gary wastes no time he instantly just 
pulls this gun out on him and says, you know, I know you've ripped me off and I know that you're planning on getting me locked up for what went down at the pawn shop. I guess Damien just kind of sat there in shock and silence, didn't say anything. Gary gets him out of the car, handcuffs his hands behind his back and shoots him. He put Damien's body in this grave that he prepared, buried him and left. And then the next day he calls the house and says to Lisa, like, where's Damien? I'm pissed off at him. He was supposed to drive me to the airport. He's a no-show. Now I'm late. And she's like, well, he didn't come home last night, which is very unlike him. Like anytime he was doing a job or if he was going to be away for an evening he was always in contact with Lisa and she knew his every move. She tells Gary though you know like okay well if and when I see him I'll let him know pass the message along for you. She's worried about Damien but she doesn't want to call the police because she doesn't really know what's going on. In her mind she was going through scenarios that maybe he had gotten in trouble with some shady people and he was just like hiding out until it was safe to come back. She also ran through the idea that like maybe somebody had him against his will and he was like trying to escape to get back to her. So she's a mess falling apart and Gary would come to the house and check on her every day, make sure she was doing okay, see if she talked to Damien. And then he starts telling her that he's like hearing through the grapevine that Damien is alive and well and like he just up and abandoned the family and left to California. She's so distraught at the thought that she tries to take her own life. She survived though and spent quite a bit of time in the hospital and on the day that she's released from the hospital she further believes that Damien is alive. I guess when she gets home she walks into the apartment and there's this note on her bedroom door and it looks like Damien's handwriting and it says that he was there and that he'll be back the next morning and when she opened the bedroom door his suitcase was on the floor with like clo his clothes like laid out on it looking like he was like picking up some stuff and then gonna leave. We obviously know that he never shows up though and good old Gary is there to you know come and check on Lisa and make sure she's doing okay. Within weeks of this note being left he had nestled his way like into the home and she started dating him. Lisa would tell people that she was so lucky to have Gary you know like he just stepped in when Damien was such a dead beat and abandon her and she just admired Gary so much too because not only did he treat her well she said that she really treated her daughter well too. I mean it just gives you like the creepy crawlies just like thinking she has no idea what he's done to like her man and once Gary got a taste of killing it was like the only way he wanted to do business I guess and like he was when he was like young like just like starting off stealing things like he couldn't get enough of it that was kind of like how it went with killing. The next time he robbed a pawn shop he chose one that was run by 36 year old Gary Jobin. Gary was familiar with the shop. He had gone there to sell some stolen items before. So Gary walks in one evening right before he is about to close and Gary's like hey how can I help you? Gary asks to check out a brooch that he has with him. He says he just wants like an estimate on its value so he like pulls it up with his little like diamond checker eye thingy you know I'm sure there's a better name for it than that but I don't know it so he's like ah oh, yeah sorry man like this is a, it's a cubic zirconia and Gary's like are you sure about that and like I think so and as he's looking down at it to you know like really confirm Gary shoots him then he robs the place and gets away with like $60,000 worth of things. What I find really interesting is there's like this pattern that's happening with like these pawn shops and antique stores where these people are getting killed. And remember like Gary had a really close relationship with some police members. There was actually one detective in particular that he was an informant for and like considered in some weird way like to be a friend of his. He actually even helped set up like another criminal in the neighborhood so that this detective could arrest him and like get like a notch on his belt. And he knew Gary's patterns, you know, like he knew he would hit these places. He knew he liked antique stores. He knew he liked jewelry, but he never put the two together. This allowed Gary to go on a crime spree for quite a few years. He does get caught and goes back to jail again. He actually got caught because he stole this like marble slab off of a bench in a cemetery. Very random considering, you know, like all of the things that he did. Like you get caught for stealing marble. After his release, he reconnects again, like to this like familiar comfort of, 
you know, his upbringing and meets up with Tim Reisdorf again. Tim was the one that wasn't really into like the crime scene, wanted to focus on the band, be famous. Now a little bit of background info that like unfolded here was that Gary always believed that the other roommate, Mike, the one he killed, was the one who ripped him off when in reality, Michael didn't rip him off at all. It was quite some time after, it was quite some time after Gary had killed Michael that he was at this pub and he ran into a woman that was like mutual friends with all of the guys. And he sees that she's wearing this necklace that he thought Michael had stolen from him. And he's like, oh, you know, like nice necklace you got there. And she's like, thanks, Tim bought it for me. So now Gary wanted to like, you know, nestle his way back into Tim's life, keep him very close. And since the last time that they had seen each other, Tim's life had changed quite a bit. He was more domesticated now. He was married to a woman named Caroline and I guess he just doted on her. She was said to wear the pants in the relationship and Tim just kind of like did anything he could to make Caroline happy. They had a son together and for work, Tim was working at like a recycle waste management company. And then on the side, he was still not really like pursuing being successful successful in a band but playing in a band like at pubs so that he could still like have you know like that passion fulfilled it was just more like now a hobby since being a husband and a father tim was now living like a very structured routine life you know very predictable work family go play with the band on friday and saturday and he always had time for his son everybody knew that about him he was home from work every day no later than 4 p.m so when he doesn't show up from work on friday october 3rd 1997 carolyn gets this pit in her stomach she paged him around 7 p.m and he did call back she said it was like very quick phone call though he said i can't talk right now i'll be home soon though and hung up she says in the middle of the night around like 1 a.m. she hears the phone ring and picks it up and she thinks that it's Tim but it's very like muffled she couldn't make out really what was happening she thinks that he's saying that he's at a Dunkin Donuts and something is going on then the line goes dead and she falls back asleep because she was actually still kind of asleep and thinking that she was talking to him in her dream so the next day she wakes up and sees that Tim's not there and it's Saturday and it's her sister's wedding so she's kind of like in the middle of like having all of this stuff to do for her sister but also being worried like where the heck is my husband so as she's getting ready for her sister's wedding she calls the police to file a missing persons report police start a file for her and she goes to the wedding she actually doesn't even tell her sister what's going on until the next day because she doesn't want to like ruin the day at all and when she follows up with the police the next day, she says she thinks that he's alive, but that he's probably being held against his will somewhere. Very similar to like what Lisa was feeling when Damien went missing. And she mentions this to the police. She says, you know, the only thing that I can think of is if he's not held somewhere still alive, he might be dead because he knows information about somebody that doesn't want it to like get out. She tells them that Tim's childhood friend Michael had been missing for the last 12 years. And the last person he was seen with was their roommate and bad egg, Gary Evans. It just so happens this detective that she's talking to is the same detective that Gary had formed this like close relationship with and was an informant for. And for some reason it was like as soon as she said Gary's name, it like clicked in him like how everything was associated and he was just like, why didn't I ever think of Gary being responsible for all of these things? And he's like, Tim's dead. This detective wanted to talk to people that knew Gary that like weren't in, you know, the criminal world. So his plan to find people who were close to Gary was to go through the visitor log of the last time that he was in jail and see if there were any names on there that like popped out that he didn't recognize. And sure enough, there was, and it was Lisa, you know, like Lisa as in like Damien's girlfriend who Gary convinced had left her and then moved in with her. Do you guys wonder in the new year if I'm just like not gonna be so awkward? 
So he heads over to Lisa and he's like, you know, like, do you know Gary's reputation? And she's like, I'm very well aware of his reputation, like he's a thief, but as far as she's concerned, she only sees like what a great guy Gary is. He, you know, stepped in and took Damien's place when he was just a, this deadbeat that abandoned her. It had been eight years that had passed by this point that Gary was like the only one that was there for the two of them. She tells the detective that the last time she had seen Gary was that Sunday, October 5th, and although she didn't think that he had anything to do with Tim's disappearance, he did seem like a little bit edgy and he told her like he needed to get out of the city immediately. Since she knew like his lifestyle and how, you know, he got his money and stuff, she just thought maybe somebody was asking after him like that he had ripped off you know she was just like another day in the life of bay the next day the police come back they want to put more pressure on her and this time she switches up her story a little bit she says it actually wasn't the sunday that she saw him it was the saturday the day before and when he came he was like shaking very nervous and he was covered in mud and he needed to get a fresh pair of clothes from the house and he left her with a couple hundred dollars and said i'll talk to you in a few years she also said that the day prior she did see Tim with Gary in the parking lot of like a TJ Maxx that was just like outside of their apartment building. But as she's providing this detail, she just can't wrap her head around the fact that like he would have done anything sinister to Tim. She just thought, you know, like they were getting together, they were both gonna flee, that maybe they had ripped off somebody and like really shit the bed on a deal and they were gonna get caught. But this detective is like, you know, unfortunately in, in denial here, like look at you, you're standing up for this guy it's obvious that he had something to do with Tim's disappearance and have you ever considered the thought that maybe he was responsible for doing something to Damien and I guess this just like really pissed her off she's like absolutely not like he's the only one who would like step in and you know now you're trying to accuse him of doing something to Damien and you're gonna try to take away my daughter's only father now like now she's gonna lose two of them so this kind of like scaled back some progress that they were making with like building trust with Lisa and it wasn't until like seven months later that she approached the detectives to help them out again. It was on May 12th, 1998 and Lisa's at this bar called Maxie's. This is a place that she frequented uh, like once a week. She'd go for a drink there and a phone call comes through and the bartender is like, oh Lisa, it's for you. It's a guy named Louis Murray. She gets on the phone and Louis Gary. He tells her he's on the run and that she's going to receive a package very soon at a place called Jessica Stones, which is another bar. And the package is going to come from a guy named Jack Flynn and she needs to go to accept it. After she gets off the phone with him, she does the right thing, calls the detective. She still doesn't think that he, you know, has killed anybody but she's like okay um I have to go and collect this package in a couple days you know like what should I do the detective's like yeah you gotta go and do that so the day comes around it's May 14th somebody from Jessica's calls Lisa and says there's a package for you here from Jack Flynn she goes and picks it up but brings it to the police station and the detective opens it and it's the most bizarre little care package that like on the phone he seems like so like you know adamant like you have to go and pick up this package like promise me now and inside of it is like Winnie the Pooh earrings, some stuffed animals, there was a few antique vases, and a shitload of photos of himself. There also was a letter to Lisa and it basically just said, you know, like, be careful who you trust, like don't talk to authorities, they're just gonna lie to you, try to get in your head, like anything that they say isn't true. He also says in the letter that he encourages her to move on and, you know, get into a relationship more so like for like security to like have somebody protect her you know and then adds that like he'll love her forever and really he's just like playing mind games because at the end of the letter he's like oh and I'm I'm going to be calling you again at Jessica's in a couple weeks so it's like move on but also keep going to Jessica's so I can talk to you she keeps popping in the bar like every day and two weeks goes by and finally a phone call comes through the bartender gets the call. The caller says it's it's Louis Murray again, and I guess this bartender was very familiar with Gary. He was a regular at this place, so he was like, Lisa, Gary's on the phone. <laughs> All he says on the phone is be back at Jessica's, where she already is, at 5 p.m. and hangs up. So she goes to the detective, they get her all hooked up with like a little recording device so she can record the call. She goes back. At 5.03 he calls and then he tells her, 
go to Maxie's now, which is the bar that she frequented. Within five minutes of her arriving, he calls and he says, go to another bar. It was like this little Irish pub that was close by. So she runs out again. Meanwhile, the detectives are like keeping their distance but following to make sure like that she's safe and that he's not gonna show up. So they're like, where the hell are we going? She takes the call in the Irish pub and Gary says that he is in the area. He's about four hours away in Vermont and he wants her to meet him at a McDonald's the next morning. She comes out, she's flipping out. She tells the detective and she's like, he says like, He's not going down without a fight. He made it clear like he has two guns and he's not going back to jail. And the detective's like, this is fine. We ride at dawn. They arrive at the McDonald's in the morning and sure enough, Gary shows up. They've got like all of these agents like undercover inside. Nobody even at the McDonald's knows what's going on. So they're just like observing him. They don't want to go in guns a blazing. It's breakfast time. There's like this huge morning rush. And Gary just kind of like walks around for two minutes looking, casing the place. He probably was aware that they were on to him. And he leaves. He's on a bike. And somehow, with all of these people watching him, he manages to disappear. So everybody is just freaking out because of how embarrassing but they manage to luck out because he comes back like an hour and a half later. He does the same like kind of little stroll through the restaurant and something in him, he's like, yeah, no, I gotta get the heck out of here. Not worth seeing Lisa. And he bolts. I guess this McDonald's is kind of close to like a wooded area and they know like he's like very stealthy, very good, you know, like at like parkouring and Spider-Manning his way out of stuff. We already know this. So they have no choice but to release like this canine dog that was with them and he just takes him the F out. The dog takes Gary out, not Gary taking the dog out. He's cuffed immediately and given his like escape escapades in the past, he's stripped butt naked right then and there in public. They're like, not today, little bare naked butt Gary, not today. It's good he was captured though because he was found with um, like pre-purchased bus tickets. He had receipts from flights that he had already taken like across the states. He had multiple hats and bandanas to conceal his identity. He even had identification for Louis William Murray III. He made himself a third. <laughs> they found out he'd actually been living under this name for quite a while and he was even working in a fishing boat up in Alaska. I mean, the guy got around. After he's arrested, the only person he wants to talk to is the detective that he, you know, had built a friendship with in the past. And he just tells him like, I, I can't do this. He's like crying. The detective's like, settle down, Gary. You brought this on yourself. Actually, he was kind of like appeasing him a bit. He wanted to like further build trust because now he believed that he was a serial killer and he wanted him to open up about it. So he comes and visits Gary for like a few weeks, builds that trust. It must have been really like frustrating though because Gary's like super dramatic. He said that one of the times that he went to go and visit Gary, he had like his pinky nails like really grown out and they were like sh super sharp and pointy. And the detective's like, like, what are those about there, Gare? And Gary's like, I'm gonna slip my wrists with these. He's like, oh God, okay. But he puts up with it because he wants answers and it pays off because a few weeks later, he admits that he's the one responsible for killing the victims at the pawn shops and at the jewelry store and also Damien, Michael, and Tim. He gives them details about what he did with Michael and how he was paranoid that he had been stealing from him. He also admitted that he was responsible for killing Damien, but he didn't want to give details and description of what happened because he he didn't want it to get back to Lisa and her daughter and like I guess I just like have to like come to terms with like what he did and that he was responsible for you know like ruining their lives. With Tim he said that he was getting paranoid like he was with Michael that he was stealing from him and that he was gonna you know cave on him and share information with the police if they were ever to be caught like for leverage so that he could get back home to his family. In his mind, he also thought like he was justified in killing Tim because he found out that he was the one who stole this necklace and not Michael. And it was like, if I knew it was you, I wouldn't have killed somebody else. I guess Gary had picked up Tim telling him that they needed to go to a storage locker that they both shared together to remove some items that were there because he felt like, you know, there was like heat coming on them and they were gonna get busted. He says they had to make like 
several trips back and forth and he was getting really frustrated because Tim's wife kept paging and calling him saying you know like you gotta come home and he was telling Gary like we gotta hurry this up I have a wedding to go to tomorrow Gary tells him okay yeah no worries man just one more trip one more trip I guess it's like 1 30 in the morning they go back to the storage unit to grab some more items and as Tim's bent over loading stuff into a box Gary shoots him from behind with Tim, Gary said he had to do something he had never done before, which was the dismemberment route. He had also pre-dug a hole like he had in the past, but I guess it was like on this like steep embankment and he needed to like make the load lighter to get there. So after sharing this, he's obviously charged with murder. He's sent to jail and on August 14th, 1998, he was being transported from the jail he was in to another county where he was being charged with um, like some burglary charges. And while they're en route, he had managed to find a handcuff key in jail. He hid it up his nose, like the side of it, and he unshackles himself in the back of the car. The police driving have no idea and when they approach the Hudson River I guess he like kicks out the window which I'm assuming like you have to be pretty strong to do I didn't even know like that was possible but he does it and he hops out flees and jumps off the bridge after all of that like the twist and turns of this story he escapes and it's just like over in the blink of an eye and he doesn't have to face anything that he did woof I mean, I don't know what I was expecting at the end of this case, but I just figured like he he always thought he was like so smart and like ahead of the pack. So for him to be just like, yeah, okay, well, like I'm out. Thankfully, at least before he did that, the families of his victims have some form of closure. They were able to bring their loved ones home and found out what happened to them. But yeah, like it's almost a case where you feel like he jumped off the river, but like really he was like, hanging on and he's out there now somewhere. I think they retrieved his body though. Anyways, I'm just making stuff up now. So yeah, that that's it for me today, you guys. Thank you so much for coming to hang out with me this New Year's. I hope you have an amazing and safe New Year's if you are going out tonight. I can't wait to see what 2022 has in store for all of us. You have all changed my life so much already. I just, I appreciate you so much and I'm just like so excited and feeling so blessed to ring in this new year together with you guys. And I can't wait to see like what happens next. I love you all. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. You know I love and I appreciate you so much. I will see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon.